Let's pray. Lord, thank you that we can gather together in your house. Thank you that where we are gathered, your spirit is present. Lord, I pray that this morning you speak in and through us, that you do the miraculous today, Lord. Father, I pray that whatever mindset we came into this place with, Lord, Father, I pray that you let us leave this place on fire for the name of Jesus. Lord, work in and through us today. Send your Holy Spirit, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I grew up as a child in the 1980s. As a teenager in the 90s, just to clarify, I'm not that old. But in the 1980s, I was a kid, and I had a favorite TV show as a kid. My favorite TV show was Knight Rider. Anybody remember Knight Rider? In fact, John is somewhere in the building. He has brought his little Knight Rider Tron figure that turns into a robot. Yeah, so, you know, John loves Knight Rider as well. And Knight Rider used to start with these words. Michael Knight, a lone crusader in a dangerous world, the world of the Knight Rider. It would say... Michael and Kit driving through, you see them, and then, and then it was finally, it would always end, this intro would end with Wilton Knight's world, words. Does anybody know who Wilton Knight is? He was the founder of Knight Industries. This is important, you're learning stuff here. And he would say this, he would say, one man can make a difference. Ooh. But you know, Michael Knight was great and all, and I loved Michael Knight, and you know, if I could have grown a curly perm at the time, I would have probably done that, but unfortunately, I, I, I didn't have the hair to do the perm. You know, but for me, that phrase, one man can make a difference, is all right, and it's true, one man can do so much. But because we're in the book of Acts, what I wanna focus on is the fact that one man can make a difference when one man is empowered by the Holy Spirit. God works in and through each of us. And what we're going to do is we're going to look today at Paul primarily and Barnabas who were on mission to, to spread the gospel, to spread the news of Jesus. And I want to have a look at how one man in Paul, <coughs> excuse me, I've got this cough still. Um, I'll have to probably see my doctor at some stage, Phil, about it. But, you know, that's, a, that's another conversation. But... Um, we're going to focus on how one man can make a difference when one man's life is about pointing people to the one man who made the ultimate difference, Jesus Christ. So we're going to have a look at Acts 14 today, and we're going to focus on three different cities that are visited by Paul and Barnabas. So we're going to look at Iconium, Lystra, and Antioch in Syria. So let's jump straight in, and we're going to have a look now at the, at the visit that Paul took to Iconium. And what we see in this next passage is we see how when Paul goes into Iconium, we see division amongst the people. So that's our first section. So let's, let's read, let's pick up the scriptures in Acts 14, and it says this, it says, Now at Iconium they entered together into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So they remained for a long time, speaking boldly for the Lord and bore witness to the words of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the people of the city were divided. Some sided with the Jews and some with the apostles. When an attempt was made by both Gentiles and Jews with, with their rulers to mistreat them and to stone them, they learned of it and fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyc Lyconia, and to the surrounding country, and, they then, and there they continued to preach the gospel. So Iconium is an interesting place because it's actually more Greek than it is Roman but it's found in the Roman province of Galatia. And Paul wrote, funnily enough, the book of Galatians to the area of Galatia. You know, so it's an important part of the ministry, but, but Paul's ministry here is not as focused on the Jewish listener as it is to the Greek listener. There has been a shift in, in, the, in the reader the, and the listener from those of a Jewish background to those of a Gentile background. 
And now we're into the kind of the latter half of the book of Acts. We see the gospel expanding. And, you know, remember the phrase that Jesus used before he ascended, that the gospel message would go out to where? To the ends of the earth. Do you know, I love it, and and I, I, I realized this the other day, that actually, at the time, where we are now is the ends of the known earth for back then. Do you know that big wall that runs along past Hexham? That was the ends of the earth to the Roman Empire around that time. We are the fruition of that gospel message spreading across the world. It's exciting to think that back then was the start of something that has spread worldwide. There is hope in the gospel and it has legs. So Paul's ministry began in the synagogue and began with a bang. It began with this wow moment. I mean, it's such an exciting start, isn't it, to a chapter. People were getting saved, Jew, Greek, it didn't matter. The spirit were moving, hearts were being changed. Can you imagine if we started seeing that in concert? The spirit moving, people meeting Jesus, people's lives being transformed. Do you know that doesn't happen by an eloquent message or any of the other stuff. It happens by creating an environment where the Holy Spirit can move and minister to each and every one of us. It's about Jesus. You know, today I chose deliberately my t-shirt of choice today, Jesus Saves, because actually throughout this, I want to let you know that despite different circumstances, Jesus saves. When God moves, it demands a response. When God moves, it demands us to respond. And the unbelieving Jews stood against the disciples again. But you know, Paul and Barnabas were on a mission. I love it. When I, was, when, back in, when I go back into my youth, when I was a teenager in the 90s, there was this phrase, on a mission. Max Power magazine coined this phrase, on a mission, and people would stick it all over the windows of their Vauxhall courses with big alloys and spoilers, on a mission. And all it meant was they were going to McDonald's car park to meet up with their mates. But actually, on a mission is what Paul and Barnabas were. They were on a mission, and in the name of the Jesus, they kept at the mission that God called them to do. Despite the opposition, the mission was number one. You know, through the miraculous, God showed the people that Paul and Barnabas were empowered and that they were servants of God. Do you know, I think it's really interesting when we look at the miraculous, we look at the miracles in the Bible. What the miracles always do is, yes, they bring healing and yes, they bring restoration, but they also draw hearts and minds to Jesus. Miracles are the working of the Holy Spirit that draw people to God. Through the miraculous, God showed up. Do you know, our faith, it's not based on miracles. It's not based on the miraculous. I don't have faith in God because God does a miracle. But when God does a miracle, it increases the faith that I already have. I see God do the incredible every day. I see God do amazing things in individual lives, whether it's physical healing, whether it's restoration of faith, whether it's overcoming obstacles and difficulties. I see God doing incredible miracles all the time. Every time I see it, I know that it's because I have a great God. The miracles, they're not about the miracles, but they're about expressing the God that brings the miracle. Warren W. Wearsby, I think that's how he pronounce his surname, said, said in his commentary, said, but faith can be bolstered by, it says, faith is not based on miracles, but faith can be bolstered by miracles. And I think that's so key. We've got to allow God to work and use what he does to inspire us in our faith. You know, the disciples, they were working in the word of his grace. That's what the Bible says here, the word of his grace. The glory wasn't theirs, but the God was glorified through them. Do you know, Paul was not the guy who brought the miracle. In the same way that Peter wasn't the guy who brought the miracle in in earlier chapters. God brought the miracle, but he used his servant whose heart was open for God to work through him. 
The glory goes to God. The miracle isn't about us, but it's about the one that we serve. You know, we've heard over and over again, haven't we, the phrase, the gospel demands a response. It's a phrase Billy Graham coined years ago, the gospel demands a response. And we've seen a great number believe in this verse, haven't we? That's what it says, a great number believed. I mean, I don't know what that number was because, well, it doesn't tell me, it just says a great number. But earlier it named figures like 3,000 men. It named these figures in here, it just says a great number. I think they got to the stage where they stopped counting all the miraculous stuff God was doing because a great number was saved. The gospel demands a response. A great number are saved. There's people come to know Jesus. It's a huge thing. But in the face of that, there is also opposition. Do you know, today as Christians, the gospel hope faces opposition all around us. We're no longer living in a society that is defined by Christian belief and ethic and worldview. We are living in a society that is outside of that. The gospel is now once more counter to the culture that we live in. But it doesn't make it less relevant. It doesn't make it less true. The gospel is still the key to salvation. Jesus is the only one who saves. Do you know, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 23, when they persecute you in one town, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not have gone through all the towns of Israel before the Son of Man comes. The opposition didn't stop the preaching of the gospel. It didn't stop the call of God on their lives. Do you know, when you face difficulties, when you face struggles, when you face trials, don't let it stop what God is doing in you and through you. Be inspired to continue. Because do you know what? The opposition comes when you're stepping out and doing something worthwhile. Keep going. Move to the next town on your list. So in Iconium, we saw division. And some would follow and some would oppose. But let me tell you that in the midst of division, Jesus saves So the disciples moved on, and they moved on to the town of Lystra. And in the town of Lystra, what we do is we see an element of delusion. Can you see what I did there? I've got some nice little Ds to make it all work. Lystra is is also in Galatia. It's about 18 miles south. So they did about an 18-mile hike. It would be like, you know, us going on on that awful journey to Newcastle, north of the river. Why you ever would want to do that when you live in God's chosen land of County Durham? I have no idea. But this was the first of three visits that Paul made to this city. And what he was doing this time was kicking it off right. When he got there, things kicked off, things happened. And we're going to have a look at that. On his secondary missionary journey there, Paul enlisted uh, Timothy in Lystra. And he made a, a visit to the church on his third journey. So there was lots that happened. But in this visit, in this trip that we see in this verse, we see four different responses to the people's encounter with Paul. So the first thing is Paul goes on to heal a crippled man. And let's see the crippled man's response to the word. In verse 8 to 10, it says this, Now in Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul speaking. And Paul looked, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice, Stand upright on your feet, and he sprang up and began walking. Just like Peter did in Acts 3, Paul heals the lame man. Now, at the time, Paul was talking about Jesus, he was preaching the gospel. The gospel was his focus, that's where his heart was. He was sharing that message, and actually, it was the man's desire to meet Jesus, it was his faith that Paul comments on. is faith that made him well. Now, that's not to say if you don't have faith, God can't heal, because he does. But actually, what God wants to do is draw us to him, because that's where he wants to be. God loves us and wants a relationship with us, so he draws us to him. Now, healing is part of that process. When we hear the hope of Jesus, it's not just for healing, but it's for salvation primarily. 
Do you know what we've got to do? We've got to run to him. We've got to go to Jesus because in him, that is where our hope is found. And through him, that is where our healing comes from. Do you know the crippled man's response to Jesus was an all-in response. It says here that he sprang up and began walking. Let me ask you a question. Are you all in? What's your response to Jesus? Do you maybe attend church on a Sunday and then get on with the rest of your week? Do you, you know, do you, do you give everything that you've got to the cause of Christ? Do you know, for me, I am passionate about Jesus beyond all others. The most important thing to me is people hearing about Jesus, meeting Jesus, and then growing in their faith, knowledge, and relationship with him. Is that the same for you? Let me encourage you to stand right on your feet, stand up, and begin to walk in the purpose that is only found in Jesus. So that was the crippled man's response to the word, and then there was the crowd's response to the crippled man. It says from verse 11, it says, And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voice, saying in Lyconian, The gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas they called Zeus. Wow. And Paul Hermes, because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. You know, miracles by themselves don't produce either conviction or faith. They must be accompanied by the word of God. The miraculous happens in relationship with the message of Jesus. The crowd's response to take, was to take Paul's word, to take the miracles and then color them in their own culture at the time. Do you know, we see that quite a lot at the moment in, in society, in theology and all of this. There's this big kind of, you know, deconstruction theology going on at the moment. And actually what that is, is that's taking God's word, diluting it and making it match our own worldview. You know, Paul here stands against that stuff. They called Barnabas, Zeus, Jupiter, the chief of gods, and Paul, the speaker, the messenger of gods. Do you know, at the time, Jupiter was the patron deity of that city. So what they had in this moment was they had this great opportunity for the priests of Jupiter to become very important and lead the people in honoring their own expression of God. They were detracting from God and infusing their own expression into the gospel message. Do you know, we live in a time when culture tries to shape Jesus into what culture wants Jesus to be. We hear phrases like, all roads lead to heaven. We hear phrases like, well, Jesus is, is all about love, so we just need a bit of love. We hear phrases like, whatever I do is okay, as long as I live a good life. We hear messages like the Christian gospel is all about self-help, self-worth, selfish, but you know, that it's all about me and I'm awesome. We hear these things colored in the gospel. We hear preachers preaching it from the pulpit and we hear that message being given to individuals and it detracts from the hope that is only found in Jesus. God even if it's our own self-worth, anything we put before him is an idol. As much as Jupiter or Mercury, Zeus, whatever the name you put on the idol, whatever you put before God is an idol before him. We need to shift our, we need to shift our strategy. You know, you could put some good, healthy things like, you know, your family or even church before God. And when you do that, what you do is you make them the idol above God. We need to put him first because that's where he belongs. We've got to worship him before all else. It's the second commandment, isn't it? Have no other gods before me. We need to put him first. Why do we need to put him first? Well, to be honest, without him... All we are is dirty, rotten sinners. Without him, we are nothing. He is the one that is everything. It's his righteousness that makes us clean. 
Now, the crowd's response was to try and manipulate the gospel to their culture, but that never works. We've got to put Christ first. So we've seen the crippled man's response to the word. We've seen the crowd's response to the crippled man. Now let's see the apostle's response to the crowd. Verse 14 says, But when the apostle Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd, crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you, and we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways, yet he did not leave, without, leave himself without witness. For he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. But Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, And having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was dead. Now I want to start at the beginning of that verse, and I want to note how the apostles rushed. Their response to the crowd was an instant one. It mattered to them that the truth of Jesus was delivered to the people in Lystria. The truth mattered to the apostles. It needs to matter to us. Paul and Barnabas, they were opposed to what they, they, they were seeing and they boldly told people that actually the gods of Lystra were vanities and that their hope needed to be placed elsewhere. I think sometimes we shy away from that as Christians, don't we? We shy away from the fact that actually the only hope is in the fact that Jesus saves Paul, what gospel do you speak? What message is on your lips? Well, for me, I believe that as Christians, we need to have a zeal and a passion to tell people about Jesus. I want to be totally sold out for the cause of Christ. And that's a journey. That's a journey I'm on. I don't think I'm totally sold out for the cause of Christ. But that's where I want to be. I want to be more like Jesus in how I live my life And I want to be more passionate about his hope day by day. Paul's message, it wasn't based on the Old Testament here because he was talking to pagan Gentiles. He wasn't talking to the Jews who understood the Torah and the Old Testament. He was speaking to a different audience. So he started in the place that they would understand. He starts with the God of creation, maker of heaven and earth. I don't know about you, but when I look at creation, when I look at the wonders of the world, even down to the intricacies of a single flower, I can't help but believe in a creating God. You know, I don't see how anybody can look at the intricate detail of the world that we live in and not understand that for this creation there has to be a creator. It has to be designed and implemented and done by a loving God. He made it clear that there was one God. Not many, not like the Greeks understood, there was one God who is the living God and the giving God and the forgiving God and his name is Jesus. The crowd, they quietened down at this message. But the troublemaking Jews came in from Antioch and Iconium Let me just say, just to clarify for anybody tuning in, that I'm not anti-Semitic and I'm just going with the passage and it's talking about a particular group of Jews. But they came in and the crowd followed their lead and stoned Paul. One minute, Paul was a god to be worshipped to the people that he was speaking to. The next minute, he was a criminal to be slain. A guy called Emerson once said, a mob is a society of bodies voluntarily bereaving themselves of reason. I think this is often true, isn't it? The echoes of Jesus here can't go amiss, can they? One minute the crowds are following Jesus and praising his name, Hosanna in the highest. And the next, they're asking Pilate to release Barabbas. What are you willing to do for the sake of the gospel? What are you willing to do for the faith that you have? 
Do you know, Paul exemplifies to me what it means to live for Jesus. Are you willing to lay it all on the line for the one who set you free? For you, that might not be a stoning, but it might be, are you willing to stand up for your faith? Do you know what? It's easy for me because as soon as somebody asks what I do for a living, I get to talk about Jesus. You know, that's easy. It's not necessarily as easy when you're in work, in school, or, or an office, or wherever that may be. But let me encourage you, stand up for your faith. The next one I want to have a look at is the disciples' response to Paul. And we're going to have a look in verse 20. And it says, but when the disciples gathered about him, he rose up and entered the city. And on the next day, he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. There were new believers in Lystra. And this was a crisis situation for them. In this town, they're seeing Paul, the guy who was leading them, stoned. They were a minority, their leader had been stoned, and to be honest, their future looked bleak. You know, I've been in situations where my futures look bleak and I don't know what's coming next. But you know what they did? They stood by Paul. They stood by their faith, they joined hearts and prayed for him, and this is one reason God raised him up. God has called us to stand on our faith. Do you know, Paul experienced stoning in this instance. And later on, you can read in different verses where Paul talks about all these horrendous things of being shipwrecked and everything else. And do you know what he says? Yet, I will worship my God. Paul was stoned, but from this came glory to God. It may have been this event that especially actually moved Timothy to ministry and eventually led him to, to going around with Paul. The disciples' response to Paul was to get alongside him, was to get with him, was to hold up the hands of the man who stood up for Jesus. Is our response the same? Do you know we have this wonderful phrase as a church that we talk about week in, week out, which is everybody contributes, everyone cares, Everyone is a soul winner. Are we in this together? Are we the living church together? Are we supporting one another in faith, in prayer, in action, in the way that we live our lives? Are we encouraging one another? When somebody faces difficulty, are we getting alongside of them in support? Do you know, I, I can't remember what, what film I was watching. It was probably one of the Disney cartoons. And there was this kind of little weedy character that was like standing up against the, whatever the enemy was in the, in the, in the story. And he's like, Arr! and there's big monsters. Arr! And he's like, I can't do it. And then suddenly the big monster goes Arr! and runs away. But you know why that is? That's because his big mate went behind him and went. Arr! Do you know, I think as the church, we need to get alongside one another as we step out for our faith. Are we supporting each other? Are we being in another's, one another's corner. The disciples were stirred into action. In this section, in the midst of division, in the midst of difficulty, Jesus saves. And our final point, as we move into Antioch in Syria, declaration. Verse 21, let's read on. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples, they returned to Lystria and to Iconium and to Antioch, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. And when they had appointed elders from them in every church, with prayer and fasting, they committed, the, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed." Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. That's a tongue tie. And when they had spoken, to, spoken in word to Perga, they went down to Atalia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commanded to the grace of God for the work they had to fulfill. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. On their return trip to Antioch, 
the missionaries were engaging in several important ministries. Firstly, they preached the gospel and made disciples. They taught many. Do you know, I think it's difficult to understand how they got back into the cities from which they'd been uh, expelled. But do you know what? God opened the doors. They went. They preached the gospel. They brought the hope of Jesus back to those places. Secondly, they strengthened, they confirmed to the believers in the things of Christ and encouraged them to continue in their faith. Are we encouraging one another? Are we strengthening one another in our faith and in our action? Do you know, continuance is proof of true faith in Jesus. Do you know, I remember for me, in faith for a load of years, I would kind of be part of this church and this ministry for a while and then I'd be part of this thing and then I'd have a bit of time out where I did my own thing and then I'd pop into this thing and I remember one of the things that God really had to do in me as a Christian was give me the ability to stick it out. One of the things I remember from my time in Newcastle and the church there was I remember pivotal times where God's message to me, despite everything around me suggesting something else, was stay put, I've called you here for a purpose. Do we stick with one another? Do we stay for the long haul? Do we stay for purpose? Let me tell you, this church is here for the long run. It's not a short-term thing. It's for concert, it's for this region, and has longevity. We're not here for the short term. The Christian life, it's not an easy one. And we all have to expect trials and sufferings and difficulties. But in the midst of that, God is with us. We are his. Let me encourage you, keep the faith. The third thing is they organized the churches. They organized the churches. Do you know, for me, I believe that the local church is both the organism and the organization. For if an organism isn't organized, it'll die. Paul and Barnabas ordained spiritual leaders. They built the church. They established the church. They made sure there was a robust structure to look after the believers and continue the message of the gospel. Church is important I believe that the church is the house of God, it is the bride of Christ, and in it, the Holy Spirit acts and moves. The church matters. And finally, they reported to their sending church on the work that God had done. They'd been gone at least a year. They were out on mission, and it must have been an exciting time for them, for the church when they arrived back home. But you know, they had the grace of God. They fulfilled the work of God that God had called them to do. And they joyfully reported the blessings of God to their home church. Do you know, I want to be a church that sends people out to do the work and the ministry of God, whatever that looks like. It might be planting other churches. It might be encouraging people in faith. It might be Kim and doing take time and the things that she does with that. There are various different things that we can do and we're out, but I want you to report back the great things God is doing so it encourages us. Do you know, I think in the final bit of here, we often, we're seeing the first missionary conference in church history. We're seeing what a conference it must have been. The way that a church officer once said, I don't care how much money you want for mission, I'll give it. But just don't make me listen to missionaries speak. Do you know, I, felt, I would feel sorry listening to that. Because actually, I want to hear the reports of what God's doing. I want to hear people missing out on the joys and wonders of the spread of the gospel. For me, that is the ultimate joy is to hear when people come to Jesus. Do you know, this was in my notes anyway, Phil, so it's not that you're here, but you know, I love the fact that last night I got a message of Philip telling me all about the fact that people met Jesus last night in the Spirit Cafe in this building. That's the most important thing. We want to draw people to Jesus. And then as a church, our role in that is hopefully those people will come in and we can help disciple them and take them on a journey of faith. Do you know, I think we need to do that better. I don't think we do that well enough at the moment. I think we need to look at how we do that. Do you know, as we close, when we declare Jesus, Jesus saves. 
His name needs to be on our lips. His hope is the only hope we need to draw people to. It's all about Jesus. We need to declare his saving grace. So as we conclude, what are Paul's principles that he lived by? Well, firstly, he worked primarily in the key cities and he challenged the believers to take the message out to the more remote places. Do you know that's why we're here in Concert Town Centre? You know, we could have planted this church in one of the little villages surrounding or wherever, but no, we're here in the town centre because actually in this region, Concert is the heart of this area. <laughs> You know, so there you go. So we planted here in concert, you know, and it's not even about the building. It's about the place because from the town, the lifeblood can flow. And we as the church will then take the message of Jesus out from there. Paul used key cities to reach the wider neighborhood. He used one approach with the Jewish congregation and he used a different with the Gentiles. With the Jewish congregations, he used the the scriptures deeply, looked at the Old Testament, looked at the fulfillment of Jesus as the Messiah. When he was preaching to the Gentiles, he emphasized the God of creation and his goodness to the nations. His starting point was different, but his finishing point was always the same, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. What he did was he met the listener where they were and then drew them to Jesus Are we meeting people where they are and then bringing them to where they need to be? Do you know, he majored on establishing and organizing local churches. As a church here in concert, we've established. We're here now. We're coming up to two. Yeah. You know, we're established. And we're slowly starting to organize as a church. It's a journey. It's why we have people like Phil and Caroline in church because they make us more organized just by who they are. You know, it's great that we're starting to see the, the meat flesh put on the bones. Jesus had the local church in mind when he gave his great commission. The call on our lives is not just to tell people about Jesus. The call on our lives is also to build the church. Now, that's not about the building, and it's not about even this meeting. It's about the global church and building the bride of Christ, building into that. The church is God's vehicle to reach a lost and dying world. And do you know what? Today, even though many people think that the pandemic changed all that, the church is still God's plan A. We've just got to be better at it. Paul, he was grounded in the, he was grounding the believers in the world, in the word of God. Do you know the only source of strength and stability when persecution comes and it will do, is the word of God. Do you know this book, it's here for a reason. God will give us fresh revelation, but the fresh revelation he gives us will always line up with what he's written in his word. God won't contradict himself. The Bible is our guide and our strength, and in it, we need to find our our stability. Dr. Bob Pierce, who who was part of Youth for Christ in the States, used to say to his staff, he used to say this, he used to say, others have done so much with so little, while we have done so little with so much. Do you know, in today's society, we have so many benefits. We have cameras and live streams, and we have technology and all this great stuff. And do you know what? I think sometimes we don't use it to its maximum. Just imagine how we could change the face of concert with the hope of Jesus if we all devoted our time, our energy, our finance, our lives to the gospel hope and to building his church. Are we sold out for the cause of Christ? Paul and Barnabas announced that the door of faith had begun opening to the Gentiles. Do you know that door's still open today? to the Jews and the Gentiles alike, to the whole world. Let me encourage you. We need to walk through that door and we need to take others in with us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that our hope is found in you. That no matter what we do, you need to be our center and our everything. 
Lord, I pray for each and every one of us that we become ambassadors for the name of Jesus. Lord, let your name be on our lips. Let us tell people about the Jesus who saves. In the face of opposition, give us strength. Give us a call to build your church. And when opposition comes, let us stand firm on your word, empowered by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. In the